So um, my name is Taran Paval. I come from Makaha, um, born and raised in Makaha. I come from a family of canoe paddlers, surfers, singers, musicians. Um, growing up, I used to sing, I used to box, paddle, canoe, surf. I was sponsored by, I was a sponsored surfer and paddler. Um, and the, those are the things that I love to do. I come from a good family. And at the age of 14, my life took a turn. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I ended up where I'm at today. So these are just 16 of my mug shots. I was arrested 44 times. I was Hawaii's most wanted and I was a meth addict for 15 years from the age of 14 to 29. How many of you are 14 in here? Okay, so at age 14, that's when my life took a turn. So I'm gonna talk about this. So it was Wainai High School graduation night. And all my friends was at Makaha Beach. Everybody was at Makaha Beach partying after the graduation. Everybody was drinking, pounding their sounds. And one of my classmates was telling me, let's go for a ride, let's go to Taco Bell. So I said, okay, we go. So the driver, his friend was 38 years old. I'm 14 at the time. His driver was a much older guy. He was old enough to be my dad. So we all jumped in the car with him. I was in the back seat and we went to Taco Bell. And when we're in the parking lot, they saw somebody that they knew and they pulled a gun out. They robbed him, put a gun to his head, they robbed him, they took all his money, all his drugs, took his chain, and they jumped back in the car. And when I seen this, immediately I saw all the money and drugs and I thought, oh, that was cool. I wanna rob people. I wanna take their chain, I wanna take their money and drugs. And so I wanted to be like them. I, wanted, I looked up to them. And um, later on that night, they started smoking this glass pipe, passing it back and forth, and blowing out smoke. And I asked them to try. I was telling them, let me try. And they're like, nah, you don't wanna try this. I said, let me try. So at age 14, I smoked ice for the first time. That night, we went up, the older guy, he drove us up, Wainai Valley. And up there, there's a property with an abandoned bus. And that bus was gutted out. There was no chairs, no seats or nothing. It was nothing but futon mattresses, blankets, pillows, towels. And I remember there being little step stools, and that's what they would sit on. And this was like a trap house where he would bring his friends to smoke and get high, and they would hang out. So we're all smoking, getting high, and my classmate, he says, oh, I'm gonna go to the store and come back. Well, long story short, my classmate never did come back. And the guy held me hostage on that bus for 12 days. He beat me, drugged me, raped me. He fed me pills to make me fall asleep. And every time I would wake up, I would have bites and bruises and choke marks around my whole body. I would have a hard time swallowing because he was choking me so hard. And I would be covered in bruises and marks. And I would beg him, please let me go home. He never let me go home. He would force me to shower in front of him. So he would sit on the bottom step of the bus and he would make me stand in front of him and he had a water hose hooked up to a fence and he would force me to take a shower in front of him while he sat there and played with himself. And I would just stand there under the hose crying, begging him, please let me go home. He's like, you're not going nowhere. So on the 12th day, he started falling asleep and I noticed and I knew that it was either now or never that I had to make my move, I had to escape. And so when he fell asleep, I ran down the road with nothing but a pareo on and no slippers, and that's how I escaped. This is where my ice addiction began. When you smoke ice, everything that was once important, your morals, your values, your priorities, all of that goes away. You feel nothing, you feel numb. And so after this happened to me, I was different, I was changed, I was broken, I was lost. I felt dirty, I felt ashamed. And I wanted to stay high, to not feel anything. I wanted to forget what happened. I didn't want to feel, I didn't want to remember what happened to me. I kept this secret for 18 years and I never spoke about it, not to a single person, not to my family, because I didn't want to give them that opportunity to say, see, I told you so. You see when you like hang with dummies? You see when you like cruise with clowns? You see when you think you're grown? When you, you see when you don't like listen or you like do what you like do? Because at age 14, I thought I was grown. 
I didn't want to listen to my family or my parents or my teachers. I thought I was grown. So I kept that secret. I held it in. I didn't speak about it. And I didn't want my family to be affected. I didn't want to tell them and then they want to get revenge and then I put them in danger. So I kept, I kept it to myself. So at age 14, my ice addiction began and um, I met a drug dealer. Like a, a year later, I met a drug dealer and he was a lot older than me and he wanted to, me to be his girlfriend. And when I say older, I mean his son was my classmate and that's how much older he was. He was crazy. He was known for shooting at people and using guns and being trigger happy. And everybody was afraid of him, but he had a lot of drugs. So I chose to be his girlfriend. And once he got me to move in with him, he started becoming very abusive, physically abusive with me. He would tie me up in his room. He would pistol with me, shove a gun in my mouth. He would do a lot of crazy things and he would hurt me in many ways that I refuse to speak about to you guys. But he used to leave me and lock me in the room and he used to have two deadbolt locks on the outside of the door. And he would tell his nephews, make sure you guys feed her under the door. And so they would put two breads, two slices of bread on a paper towel and they would put ham and cheese or peanut butter and jelly and they would slide it under the door. And I would have to pull the napkin through and that's how I would eat. And I would cry and I would beg them, please open the door, like let me out. And they'd be like, I'm sorry, we can't. He's, he's gonna kill us, we can't. And one time I managed to escape and um, I ran away and asked one of my girlfriends for a ride. And within the same hour, he found us. He pulled up on the side of us with a, with a dirt bike. He pulled his gun out and he unloaded a whole clip into her transmission. He pulled her out of the car, he smashed her head into the, the pavement and he started kicking her in her stomach. And that was the last time I ever did ask anybody for help because I didn't want to put someone in danger. I didn't want someone to get hurt because they were trying to help me. So I never did ask anybody for help after that. Another time I tried to escape, I ran to my uncle's house. My uncle was almost 80 years old and my uncle raised me from when I was a little girl. And I'm, it was on St. John's Road. And um, my uncle was, in, was on the couch. I was cooking something on the stove and I hear him pull up outside and the phone rings. I answer the phone and he tells me, if you don't come outside, I'm gonna put a bullet in your uncle's head. So of course, I'm gonna come outside. Of course, I'm gonna leave with him because I don't want my uncle to get hurt for me. So I left with him. And I remember jumping on the back of his dirt bike and him packing me and him telling me, stop trying to run from me, Taran. He's like, you're not leaving me. And I just remember holding on while he was driving, tears coming down my eyes and me thinking, when is my life gonna change? I started committing crimes, I started robbing people, I started selling drugs, I started stealing cars, I started robbing businesses, breaking into homes, I started taking identities. I have 44 arrests. I did nine years and nine months in prison. I did seven and a half years in state prison and two and a half years in federal prison. I've been to seven different prisons in my life in different states. And so my career as a criminal began. And um, I, used, I, I wouldn't care who I hurt. I didn't care who you were. If you were a guy and you flirted with me, I was gonna rob you. If you were a drug dealer, I was gonna rob you. If you are a business, and you know, if I could break in, I would take whatever I could. If there was a car that I could steal, I would steal it, I didn't care. So, at a young age, I started getting arrested, and you can see by my mug shots how young I was when I started to get arrested. You know, and there's like mug shots like this, when I didn't even care, I was just, I didn't care. My life, I was broken. I didn't care what happened to me. To be honest, I wanted to die. And so one day when he left and he locked me in that room, I remember just crying and being so miserable and so broken that I wanted to kill myself. So I searched his room down and I found every bottle of pills that I could find. And I took every pill that I could find. He had his pain medication, his lupus medication, and I took everything. And I just wanted to end my life. And I remember waking up in a hospital and they had me connected to IVs, they had pumped my stomach. And I remember looking to my right and he's sitting right there staring at me. And the first thing I did was start screaming and crying. And I started yelling at the doctors like, why did you guys save me? Why did you guys save me? You ruined it. I didn't wanna be here. 
You ruined it. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. They're like, Tehran, it's our job to save you. And I just remember being so mad because my plan to take my life failed. And so two days later, he got arrested. He got sent to prison for 10 years. And it was because he shot at somebody at Pokai Bay and he got busted. So that's how I was removed from that situation. But now at this point, I'm 17 years old. I'm ruthless. I've been through so much trauma and so much damage that I didn't know how to smile or laugh or be happy. I was angry. I hated everybody. I wanted to hurt everybody. So I took it out in my, my crime and all the things that I would do, you know? And I didn't care who I hurt. My family would beg me to come home, but I couldn't. I just wanted to stay on the streets. I wanted to stay numb. I didn't want to feel. And I felt like the streets was my family. You know, that was my home. So sometimes I didn't have a place to go. I would steal cars just to sleep in them. I would steal cars just so I had a place to store my things, you know? And so um, everybody around me, they started getting stabbed, shot, killed. So my ex-boyfriend, he got shot in the face. So today he walks around with a glass eye. Another one of my exes got shot twice in the stomach and he survived. And today he walks around with a colonoscopy bag. And so like every time he takes a shit, it, you can see it. And he has to change that bag every time he uses the bathroom. Um, my ex-boyfriend, his name is Dace. He got stabbed to death over a drug deal gone bad. My friend, one of my best friends, Tommy, he got beat to death over a half gram of meth and some motorcycle parts. My friend Tatum shot up dope in her arm and got an infection and she died. Another one of my homies shot up too much dope and it stopped his heart, he died. This, this can go on and on and on and on and on because I lost so much people in that life. I lost so much people that were close to me. But for me, what hit me was my 20 year old brother. So his name was Mackenzie and he was nothing like me. He was a good kid, he got good grades, he was quiet, he was to himself. He never did do drugs. He never did do crime. And it was two weeks before he turned 21. And he went to a rave with his, with his friends and they were all drinking alcohol. And one of his friends gave him a pill. Yeah. And within 10 minutes, that pill stopped his heart and he died. So my brother died at the age of 20. And guess what his friends did? when they saw him fall on the ground. Does anybody know what they did? They left him. They left him and my brother died alone. They were so afraid of getting in trouble for being the one who gave him a pill. They were more afraid of getting caught than they were of saving his life. So instead of trying to get him help, instead of taking him to an ambulance or an emergency room or to a doctor, they ran. And they, they left him. And the medical team said, you know, if someone would have gotten him help, we probably could have saved him. So my brother died two weeks before he turned 21. For three days, my mom couldn't get a hold of me when my brother was dead. Three days, she tried to call me. And I wasn't answering. And you know where I was? I was in a trap house in Kalihi, selling drugs, making money. And at that time, that's all I cared about. All I cared about was making money, selling drugs, and staying high. That was the only thing that was important to me. I didn't care about anything else. If he wasn't making me money, I didn't care about you. And so when my mom was trying to get a hold of me, she couldn't get a hold of me for three days. While my family was in a hospital, with my brother hooked up to life support, they were trying to say their last goodbyes to my brother I was nowhere to be found. So I was the only one who wasn't there, and I should have been. They were there mourning and falling apart and needing me, and I was nowhere to be found because I was too busy selling drugs, too busy making money in a trap house and surrounded by people who could care less if I was to walk in the street and die and get hit by a bus or get shot. They would not care. They could give two shits about me. But yet my family, the people who really loved me, the people who needed me, I wasn't around. They couldn't get a hold of me. So I chose these people in the streets over my family. You know, I was missing Mother's Days and birthdays and Christmases and Thanksgivings. Missing these things to be with these people who 
All they wanted to, to do was make sure I provided for their needs. As long as I provided for their needs, as long as I continued to give them those drugs to stay high, then everything was all good. But in reality, not one of those people cared about me. And so when my brother died, it hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized when my mom and when my family needed me the most, I was nowhere to be found. And so when I finally did answer my phone and my mom told me, Taran, why haven't you been answering? And I'm like, why, what's up? She's like, Mackenzie's dead, Taran. Where were you? And I was in shock. I was in shock because I realized like, wow, I wasn't even doing shit. I was sitting here in this stupid ass house surrounded by all these greasy looking people, everyone smoking drugs and getting high. And that's why I wasn't there. And I realized that at this point, I realized if, I, if this didn't change me, then nothing ever would because how much more pain, how much more loss, how much more death would I have to experience before it, I change? And so at this point, I didn't want nothing more to do with drugs. I didn't want to sell drugs to make money. I didn't want to do it to get high. It took 15 years of my life I was stuck on drugs, from 14 to 29. That's 15 years I cannot get back. Nine years and nine months in prison, that's almost 10 years I cannot get back. That's 25 years of my life that was stolen from me because of that one choice I made. Jumping in a car with them, looking up to them, wanting to be like them because I thought they was cool. Do you think that when I jumped in that car that night that I thought that I was gonna get raped? That I was gonna get held against my will? That I was gonna get addicted to something that would change my life? Hell no. I never thought that. At my age, we had this thing called the D.A.R.E. program or the Big Bear and all they used to tell you was, don't do drugs, stay in school. But nobody said why. Nobody said why. Why do, shouldn't we do drugs? Why should we stay in school? Nobody told us that. Nobody told me. But maybe if somebody came to me when I was 14 and told me the truth and the reality about addiction, maybe I might have thought differently when I jumped in that car and saw, saw them smoking. Maybe I would have thought differently and not tried it or not wanted to be like them. Maybe I would have I thought twice before I took a hit off that pipe. But nobody came and told me. And you know what? That one decision changed the course of my entire life. That one decision to try to be curious, to look up to the wrong crowd. And so after my brother died, I realized that I didn't want to have nothing to do with drugs anymore. And I asked God, I said, God, please help me. Help me and save me from my addiction. I've been stuck for 15 years. Please help me. Help me get away. Help me break free. And you know what? By the grace of God, I've been clean and sober six years today. Six years. And it was the greatest decision I ever made in my entire life. When I changed and when I closed the doors of my old life, God opened new doors for me. When I first got sober, I didn't have friends. The only friends I had was people who stole, people who robbed, pe criminals, drug dealers, users, people who did drugs. That's the only people I knew. I didn't have not one friend that was living a good life. I didn't have one friend who I could lean on or one support group or anybody I could talk to. When I got sober, I got sober on my own. And um, the first thing I did was I, I sobered up for a couple weeks and I realized I, I had to remove myself from everything associated with my addiction. You know, and um, I couldn't deal drugs no more because I couldn't just quit doing drugs and continue dealing drugs. So I quit selling drugs. And um, I started working a regular job. I was making $9.75 an hour from making a lot of money being a drug dealer. I chose to work at the airport doing parking. And you get paid every two weeks. And when I got my first paycheck, I was like, this is it. I didn't really, I was like, wow, I don't know how I'm gonna survive. And so I kept working and I kept I kept working and I kept staying sober no matter what I didn't use. I didn't pick up. And there were people who would come to my house after I told them, I told them I quit. I told them I was done with that life. But they would still come. A couple weeks after I told them I quit, they would still come knocking on my windows, asking me, you know what I And I had to remove myself. I was living in Kalihi at the time. 
on Gulick Street, right across from a game room. And so all the chronics would come knocking on my door, knocking on my windows, and so I had to move. I moved from Kalihi, I moved to Mililani to be away from what I knew, to be away from all these people. And um, the next thing I started to do was work with the homeless. I started working with the homeless and I liked my job. I liked my job because it was my way of giving back, of helping people that was struggling. And I ended up getting fired from that job after like five or six months because I was punching mints with the, the people that lived there, with the residents. And um, they told me, no, you cannot be doing that on the job. But little did they know that there was three guys there that I was helping to stay sober. And punching mints and training was a positive activity that was helping them stay sober. So the next job I got was as a caregiver, taking care of elderly, taking care of people who were like paralyzed, you know, couldn't take care of themselves. And one day I got asked to speak to elderly and and to tell, share my story with them. And these elderly were people who their kids were locked up or their kids were on the streets doing drugs or addicted and they were with their grandkids. They were stuck taking care of their grandkids because their kids was messed up. So one day I spoke to them and I guess my message was so impactful to them that they asked me to come and speak again and then come speak to foster kids. And then I started to get asked to speak at schools. And I've been speaking at schools for over three years now. And never in my life would I ever think that I'd be standing in front of a group of anybody with something important to hear. You know, like who would want to listen to me? I've been an addict for 15 years. I was locked up for almost 10 years. I was a career criminal. Hawaii's most wanted. Why would anybody want to listen to me? But you know what? I don't regret anything I did because God allowed me to turn that mess into a message. Because, because of what I've been through and what I survived, I'm standing here today reaching and speaking to all of you. And I know half of you probably not even listening, you know, might be going in one ear, out the other. But as long as I might just touch one of you guys, then that's all that matters to me. I don't get paid for this. This is not my job. This is not my career. I don't have to be here. This is my passion. I come on my own dime and my own time. I flew myself from Vegas. This is not a paid event. I'm not a paid speaker. I do this out of the love of my heart because when I look at you, I see myself. I see, I see myself. And if I can prevent you guys from experiencing the pain and the brokenness and the heartache that I went through, then my time here isn't wasted, you feel me? I'm not here to bore you, to lecture you, to waste your time, to waste my breath. I didn't go to school for this. I didn't study this in no textbook. I ain't your teacher and I ain't your parent. I lived this shit. I survived it. And that's why I'm here. So everything I'm telling you right now is the truth. It's facts. Drugs ain't a joke. It ain't a joke, guys. I know a lot of times, you know, we hear music talking about popping mollies, taking keys overseas, and dealing drugs and all this shit, but they don't talk about the reality and what happens after you become addicted. What happens after you start smoking drugs and you lose everything? You start losing your house, your kids, your family. How many of you see people walking on the side of the road talking to themselves? How many of you know someone who's addicted? So I had a friend. He was good looking, he was handsome, all the girls liked him. He was a boxer and a surfer. And one of my friends gave him drugs. And to this day, he's walking on the side of the road by Wainai Harbor. Sometimes he's naked, but he's pushing a grocery wagon full with rubbish, and he's talking to himself. And every time I see him, if I go take him food, if I approach him, he don't even recognize me. He don't know who I am. He doesn't know, you know, we can't even hold a normal conversation and he'll never be the same. Even though we grew up together, and I knew him from when he was, we were young, he don't even recognize me. He'll never be the same. So what I'm saying is that sometimes you can try drugs thinking that, oh, I'm gonna just try it one time. So the thing about drugs, yeah, is that you can't just pick it up and put it down. Once you touch it, it's meant to steal everything good in your life. It's meant to kill and destroy. That's what drugs are meant to do, to make you become trapped, 
to make you become addicted, to keep you stuck. It kept me stuck for 15 years. 15 years. That's longer than some of y'all been alive. That's how long that drug held me captive. So when I tell you that it's not a joke, I'm not playing. I'm not playing. I'm 35 years old, and I've wasted so much years of my life, but I don't regret it because there was a plan and a purpose in all of my experiences. And that's to be here, that's to reach you, and that's to prevent you guys from following in my footsteps. Anybody can be this. Anybody can, can do what I did. Anybody can become addicted. Anybody can be a criminal. Anybody can go to prison. I, all, it, all it took was that one choice. So each and every one of you are one choice away from being this person. So choose your friends wisely. Don't be looking up to the wrong crowd. Don't be doing stuff to fit in or trying something because you think your friends is cool and they're telling you to try. Because you can easily become this person. Does anybody in here want to grow up to be a drug user or an addict? Do you think I woke up or, or got up one day and just decided, today I want to just ruin my life and be a drug dealer? Or today I just want to become addicted? Hell no. I never intended for that, but it happened. And so I'm here to tell you that drugs is not a game. It's not cool to sell drugs. It's not cool to do drugs. When, I, when my family fell apart after my brother died, I realized that every time I sold drugs, every time I flooded the streets with drugs, I was becoming a part of the problem. So the same pain that was caused in my family when my brother died, I was causing that pain in someone else's family because I was causing somebody's parent to not come home or somebody's husband and wife to not come home or I was causing someone else to become addicted, someone else to commit crime. And I realized I was part of the problem. And that's why I want nothing more to do with drugs. That's why I'm trying to speak life into you guys to change your mindsets at this age because this is the age when it comes. This is the age when all the temptation will come. You guys are gonna be introduced to drugs. Probably half of you already, already been introduced. Half of you probably have family members or know people who do drugs, sell drugs. So when you get faced with a decision, because you will, and one of your homeboys come up to you and be like, hey, try this. Try this, the thing is killer. You have to be that leader. How many, of, how many of you in here can actually be a leader and not a follower? Is anybody in here leaders? Nobody? Not one of you guys are leaders. You guys are all followers. Wow. Not one single hand went raised. That's crazy. You guys need to be a leader and stand up for what is good. Stand up for what is right. It's sad that not one single person raised their hand to say, I'm a leader. That just blew my mind. <laughs> this whole room is followers. If you guys want to become this person, then go ahead and follow the crowd. But make sure that when you play with fire, you're ready to get burned. Make sure when you start doing drugs that you're ready for the consequences. Because I promise you, it will come. So I'm not going to waste any more of your time. I know you guys have to go pretty soon. Um, all I ask is that in the future, when you guys are faced with a decision to choose, that you guys choose the right way. That you guys just take my story with you. Take it with you and remember it. Remember me. So that in the future, when you have to decide whether or not you should try something, that you remember my story and choose the right thing. Because I don't want to see any of you live this life. I don't want to see any of you walking on the side of the road or living at the harbor or talking to themselves or throwing their life away. So thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me share, guys. Take care.